so good to be here this morning with you all, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity we have to study together. The title of our lesson this morning is Perseverance, and when you get down and discouraged and disappointed, maybe even feel lonely and blue, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's say you you feel like you're running up these steps. What's wrong with these people that run up those stadium steps anyway? They run up them and then they go back and do it again and again, day after day. But, you know, just an example, let's say that you just graduated from college and you've got a job. You've got a pile of student loans, but you've got a job. And you sort of see a way that you're going to be able to pay everything off and then your faithful car the car that you drove to college and you carried you all the way through and your parents aren't going to pay for anything anymore, the car breaks down. Maybe you graduated and you can't find a job. Or maybe you've got a job and you're just figuring out your boss and getting into the groove and things are going well and they announce that you got a new boss and the rumor is that he or she is worse than Attila the Hunt. Or maybe you got a job and you go in and one day, one morning, and they announce that they're doing cost cutting and consolidation and they've eliminated your job. Or you go to the doctor and they, he lets you know that you have a serious illness. Or you work with a loved one about their service to God and you think you're making progress. Then you see signs that they're slipping back, slipping away. In other words, you just ran up those steps and you turn around, you got to run up the steps again. Well, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Here's a, here's a picture of perseverance. That, this lizard, the crane thought he had his breakfast, but the lizard was hanging on. You'd say that lizard was certainly persevering, and the, the crane was trying to get his breakfast, and the lizard was trying to evade certain death. But think about this. Here's a young lady playing the piano with her toes because she doesn't have, you know, arms and fingers like you and I do. There's a lady named Susan Kovac, K-O-V-A-C. You can look her up online and see on in YouTube. She, she has a congenital defect where she doesn't really have arms, hands. And this lady writes. They show pictures of her handwriting, but it's done with her toes. It's beautiful. She drives. He plays the piano, crochets, all these things with her toes. And those are kind of images that I have in my mind when I think about perseverance. The definition of perseverance is to persist in anything undertaken, to maintain a purpose in spite of difficulty, obstacles, or discouragement, to continue steadfastly. And if you look at that word, severe is in that word for, it seems like, for a reason. If we live long enough, we're all going to experience tough times and trials and tribulation. Ecclesiastes 12.1, we read, remember now the Creator in the days of thy youth, before the evil days, King James says, draw nigh, the evil days come, and the years draw nigh, which you say, I'll have no pleasure in them. When we're young, we don't have that many, usually, that many evil days. But as age comes on us and life's experiences we go, go through, we find out about those things called the evil days. Life is going to try us in three ways, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. That's where we are called to persevere. 
The first thing we look at is spiritual test in James 1. We'll look at James 1, 12, and 13. James 1, 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life which God has promised to them that love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Temptation indeed is a test. And every time we're tempted, it's a matter of will we resist, will we stand fast, will we overcome that temptation, or do we give in? We have to pers persevere through those kinds of temptations. Another trial that we face is physical. And in some countries today, but not in America, if people face physical tribulations because of their faith. 1 Peter 2, 19 and 21, again we read, that, For this is a gracious thing, then be mindful of God, one who endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what good is it if when you sin you are beaten for it and you endure? But if you do good and suffer and endure, it's a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you may follow in His steps. While we don't see physical tribulation for our faith today in America, we, all, you know, we very well could, and certainly we can know through history that Christians suffered mightily from the first century on for their faith. Probably something that we all experience from time to time is the emotional trials in life. The Apostle Paul experienced many things, and he gives us a glimpse of his thought process and even some of his emotional struggles in the letters that he wrote. Look at Philippians 1 and 19, but we'll, well, 19 through 25, but we'll re, let's just skip and we'll start reading with verse 21, Philippians 1, 21. Paul is talking and struggling with this idea of even leaving this life and going to be with Jesus. The, the appeal, the, 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 what he longed for as he wrote this, it seems that he longed to leave this life and be with Jesus. And you think about people that are suffering terminal illness or some long protracted illness, and maybe they do want to leave this life. And, you know, it's not our choice to control the timing of when we're able to do that. We may have to suffer a long time before we actually leave this world. My brother, who lived over in the woodlands, died of ALS, Lou Gehrig syndrome. And a very, very cruel way to end up dying. And it gets down to the end that you just wish they could die. And eventually they do. They, they succumb to the disease. But to see that firsthand is, is, is really sobering to think about this because as, as Paul said in Philippians 1.21, and we'll read this, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if I live to the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm pressed hard between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know I'll remain and continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith. And you know, it gets down to this, that it, the, taking the exit in life might be the easiest thing, but God has other plans for us, and other people need us, even in our weakened state, and so we hang on. And we know as we, as we sit here this morning that difficult days are ahead. Maybe worse for some than others. Maybe some of those difficult days are already here, just Look through the announcements that we got this week. And 
getting through that evil day, as the Bible calls it, that's where that phrase comes from where we tell people, just hang in there, just hang on, stay strong, take it one day at a time. But rather than those kind of words, this morning I wanted to give us six ways that we can, six things that we can do to help persevere, help us persevere. So I've got six things here on the board. We're going to look at them, each one of them in turn and see if we can be ready and able, better able to persevere the challenges, the temptations, the trials that we experience right now or those we may experience in the future. The first thing we're going to look at is to prepare. And a great passage on being prepared for the, uh, the evil days is Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18, starting with verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, the ESV says, the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, and shoes for your feet, put on, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, Verse 16, and in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, which you shall extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, there's our word, making supplication for the saints. And we see that the elements that are needed to be prepared for prolonged perseverance. So at the end of the lesson today, when I'll ask you, what did I preach on? You can say, we're going to be prepared for prolonged perseverance. There'll be a test at the end. Well, those things that we do to be prepared for perseverance. We want to study God's Word, pray, and build our faith, but do it in advance. The idea here is that in the heat of the battle, when this evil day is on us, it's good to turn to God's Word. It's good to pray, but it's also helpful to do this in advance. Being prepared is key. That doesn't mean we go about living our lives like nervous Nellies and always worried about the next thing that's coming down. or going. To, but the idea is that we'd be prepared. And by that I mean find passages... We know that reading God's Word is helpful and good for us. Find passages now and that are comforting to you that you would have a, at your ready when you're struggling, when you are suffering. If we don't invest time now when things are good, it'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll be helpless, more helpless in times of trouble. And just think about it like you're getting ready to go on a trip or camping or to the hospital. Uh, people that were getting ready to have a baby, right? And they, a lot of, oftentimes there's a suitcase by the door so that when they rush out of the hospital on the multiple trips that they go, thinking that it's time for the baby, they've got the suitcase. They're not scurrying around, flying around, trying to pack everything they need. And we think about perseverance in this same way. You know, you'd, if you're going, even those of you that have, like I have, been to the hospital, you're going for a surgery or something like that, then you pack your clothes, bring your Bible, phone charger, your reading glasses. If you knit, you're knitting. I don't bring knitting. Car plan cards, magazines, something to pass the time so you'll be ready. We think about it in advance. That's the idea. The same strategy was for experiencing times when our perfect perseverance is necessary. So we think about preparing. And then we want to maintain a positive attitude. Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness, some translations use gentleness, be known to everyone. The Lord's at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Now, no one expects us to laugh out loud when we're suffering, when we experience a temptation. And 
it'd be crazy if we said, this is the, we're suffering something bad's happened to us. And this is the best thing that ever happened to me. That doesn't make sense. But we can have a positive attitude. And, we, and that is what I think of when I read this, rejoice always in the Lord. Romans 12 and 12, and I got this from the NIV, we read, Romans 12, 12 says, Be hopeful, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Christians have a more positive attitude about the things that are happening to them generally than the rest of the world. And why is that? Why can we have a positive attitude when we're suffering, when we're facing things that have happened, even death and so on? It's because we know that where this is not all there is. There's some place better that we're looking for that place. Doctors say that patients with positive attitudes always do better and heal quicker than the woe is me, I'm dying patient. And in Philippians 4 and 13, we remember these words, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So we maintain our faith we believe, we rejoice in the context that we have a positive attitude. You can do all things through Christ. Another thing that we can do as we deal with and have to persevere things, the trials and temptations of life is sing. Now, that may be counterintuitive and it may be crazy sounding, but let me give you an example that we see in Acts chapter 16. Just to kind of refresh and quickly set this up, there was a slave girl, and her masters used her. She had some evil kind of spirit, but she could foretell the future, and her masters used her and got much money from doing this. And then we pick up, and, and Paul and them, they cast that spirit out of her, and she no longer was possessed, but then she no longer could make money for her masters. And this is where we pick up in verse 19, Acts 16, 19. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace before the rulers. And they said, we read that they said they were disturbing the city and turning it upside down and advocate customs that are not lawful for Romans. In verse 22, the crowd joined in attacking them. The magistrates tore the garments off of them and they gave orders to beat them with rod. And when they inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the, the jailer to keep them safe. We know all this. And they fastened, verse 24, they fastened their feet, in, their feet in stocks. And what was the response? And what happened? Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And then you remember there was a great earthquake and the things opened, the doors opened and all. And then they, they kept the jailer from killing himself and all these things. And in the end, he and his whole household were baptized. But in this, in the midst of unbelievable persecution, Paul and Silas were singing. It's impressive that they were singing when they were still in stock, their feet in the stock. There's something marvelous and infectious and faith-building about singing spiritual songs. Didn't you get that as we sang farther along this morning? Did you get it? Did you feel it? Did you know and understand in the spirit what, what that song was trying to tell us? And the, your voices blended so well together. It's great to be up front because you can hear everybody really well singing. There's something about singing. I read where in early America, the slaves, when they were working in the fields, owing oh, cotton, whatever they did, that oftentimes they would be singing as they were doing this backbreaking work in the blistering sun. And you've heard of people, prisoners in jail working on the chain gang, and they sing as they broke rocks or all the crazy things they did. But I noticed something since we moved here to Texas. In our neighborhood, a lot of people are getting their houses, roofs redone. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but I have in our neighborhood that there will be a crew of men working on the roof, and they'll have their music blasting. And they will be singing. It's blistering hot. You know that in Texas. 
and they're on the roof at 100 degrees or more, and they're singing. There's something about that comfort in spirit that we get by singing, and especially singing praises to God. So, and maybe you can't just sing as you walk down the road. You could if you wanted to, but you certainly can have a song. How many of you have songs in your mind, and you repeat those songs, and you hear those songs? And I knew a lady back in Alabama. She was dying, um, had breast cancer, old, had breast cancer. She loved to sing, and as she was in the hospice care and all that, she would be singing. You could hear her singing praises by herself. And if you went to visit her, she'd love for you to sing with her. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Singing psalms, hymns, and praises makes a difference when we're suffering. And the main thing it does, it fills our mind with positive images and message. Farther along, we'll know all about it. You know, that song, we see these people, what are they doing? They're getting along, so living so wicked year after year. You know, that kind of grates on our nerves sometimes, seeing all these people doing so well, and my car just broke down. But farther along, we'll know all about it. So singing helps keep those images in our mind. And don't be afraid to request help. Again, we look to Paul. Turn, turn to 2 Timothy 4, 5-22. This passage is so touching to me about Paul. He's writing. And you know the Apostle Paul, he writes, and don't do this, and you can't do that, and you'll do this, and you're condemned if you do that, and so on, and harsh. And even he was, maybe some say that he was criticized by his, for his harshness as he delivered God's message to his hearers. But we see a, such a sweet, vulnerable side of Paul as he's writing this letter, imprisoned and writing this letter. I won't read the whole passage. This, I just got it there for, for, for your references, 2 Timothy 4, 5 through 22. But in verse 9, he says, I'll just highlight a few of these. Do your best to come see me soon. You ever been to visit grandma, grandpa, somebody, and they say, come back, come back and see me again? Because they realize their time is shorter now than it was before. They're not young like you, and I'm going to live forever. And they say, please come see me. Come see me soon. Paul said, come see me soon. He made another request. He said, get Mark and bring him. And what a story that is behind that expression right there for Paul, John Mark great study in that in and of itself. Verse 13, he says, bring my cloak that I left at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchment. Now just think about what he's saying here, the books, how rare it was to have books, and the parchment. The parchment could be the manuscripts that we you have, that are, our scriptures are based on. Some of those could have been those Parchment. And he said in verse 19, greet Priscilla and Aquila. Again, the backstory on that is so good. Verse 21, he said, do your best to come before winter. So you can see that Paul was willing to make known his request to the folks he was writing to. He was certainly suffering tribulation and trial. And he was persevering. And he was open to asking for help. And a lot of times we're not open to asking for help. He sums it up in verse 18 of this passage. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Because see, that's where we're really all going. The heavenly kingdom. kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Here we learn from Paul a couple of things. When you need help, ask for it. That's very important. When you need help, ask for it. Who are you going to call? You can call your brethren, and they'll come and help. They'll come. The kind of help that they can provide is prayers for you, counsel. They can talk to you about the struggles that you have, an ear to listen. They can come and just listen to you while you tell them of the troubles that you're experiencing, your fears, and so on. They can be comfort. They can be company. But none of that will happen if you don't reach out and ask for it. See, the danger of suffering alone is being alone. So we want to make it known so that, and, and, and 
No, you, you, we should know that your prayers will be heard and your request will be known. And while we haven't worshipped long with you guys, I can say assuredly that if you need help, you will be helped. That's been proven time and time again already in our short time here for everybody in the congregation. Another kind of weird expression is patiently establish your heart. Well, let's, we had read some of this. Let's read, uh, let's look back over to James 5 and start in, in looking in verse 7. Actually, we'll look at just verse 8. You also be patient. Establish your heart for the coming of the Lord. And that, that idea of establishing your heart is, is, is translated other 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 passage other translations use the word stand firm, uh, strengthen your faith. The interesting thing he says, also be patient first, establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And goes on to talk about don't grumble, go on and remain. Verse five and eleven says, consider those who, blessed who have remained steadfast. Caden read this for us early. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, for the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so, if you have any questions about someone suffering, it really the message Paul has given here is, or James was given, is look to Job and read about Job and see what all that he suffered. But he wisely says here, be patient. As I've grown older, I'd, and, and I never thought about this when I was young and, let's say, really healthy. But I've gotten older, I've learned about patience. You know, the medical system that we're a part of. I, that's why doctors and nurses call us patients. The doctors have patients, and we patients have to have patience. What I'm saying is you call up a doctor, what do you do? You wait on the phone rings and rings and rings, and they offer to call you back, or you just wait on hold just to get to a doctor, and then you get an appointment, and what do you have to do for that? You've got to wait for that appointment. And the date rolls around, and you go to the doctor's office, where do you go? To the waiting room. And you wait in that room a long time, then they take you back, and where do you go there, and what do you do back there? you all been there, you know what I'm talking about. You wait in a little room. Then the doctor comes and looks at, well, the, Sometimes it's somebody else, I don't know, different letters in their names, PAs and CPNs and CRPs and this and that. And then they come. Then the doctor comes. Finally, you've been waiting. They come and they do tests or order tests. What do you do about that? You got to wait for those tests. And then they run the test. And what are you doing? You're waiting on your diagnosis, waiting for them to tell you what's wrong with you. And don't get me started on the ER. How many people have been to the ER? What do you do there? Wait. See, so you learn patience. If you're a patient, you learn patience. And those, when we're facing those kind of trials and temptations, it's hard to be patient, really, just because what? We naturally want things to get done. We want to get better. We want to resolve themselves. We want to know, but we learn patience. And the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9, you remember, he asked God to remove a thorn from his flesh. He, it says he pleaded with God to remove this flesh, thorn from his flesh, three times. And God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, that's easier said than done, this idea of patience. But to pers persevere, we have to have patience. Finally, visualize victory. Now, if you talk to any great athlete or great performer, they'll tell you that they visualize whatever it is that they're doing. They visualize it happening. The golfer, he hits that thing, and he visualizes the ball rolling up and going into the hole with the flag pole in it. The basketball player that takes a three-point shot, he visualizes that ball going into the net. The quarterback visualizes, they visualize what their success in what they're doing. And talk about visualizing something. Look at Stephen. And you know the backstory here. Stephen was, this is in our account for us in Acts 7, 54 and 56. Stephen had been preaching. 
and the crowd turned on him. So much so that they were gnashing their teeth at him. And I'm sure that Danny has preached to some rough crowds in his time, but probably none of them have turned to you and wanted to bite you, not publicly. But this is what they, and they were going to kill Stephen. Remember Acts 7, 54, now when they'd heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. Some translations said they gnashed their teeth. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they, that was the last thing they wanted to hear. And they did stone Stephen. But as he was about to be stoned, he looked and could see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He visualized the ultimate victory. And when, really that, that is when we think it's all coming to an end, and it may and it will one day, then as believers we'll visualize victory. And that is we'll think about heaven, we'll think about our Savior like Stephen did, and we'll think about what it'll be like to be in the presence of God with all those that have gone on before us. And, and as we persevere through tough times, we can think about the future and what it will be like when our present trials are over. Probably you notice that these six things are activities. They're things you do. Common to all of this is actually doing something. Don't just sit and worry. Be active. Let's just think about all that we've talked about this morning before we have our invitation song. What do we do when we work on our perseverance? Number one, we prepare. Two, we rejoice. Three, we sing. We visualize victory. We request help. We establish our heart. We endure. We stand firm. We endure and we persevere. There you have it. Six things. Maybe there's something in there that you've heard this morning that will be helpful to you. Or maybe someone that needs the help from the congregation or needs to be, turn their life to Christ. We give that invitation now. Come as we stand and sing if we can help you. Bring from